It is Locked on Jazz for the 21st of October. With the sun rising, I don't know if you can see it, behind me in Minneapolis, Minnesota, it is Locked on Jazz. We're talking about Rudy Gobert and the Timberwolves. And where did all his touches go when he was in Salt Lake City? And why is he getting more touches in Minnesota? And plus how the Wolves looked against Oklahoma City. The Jazz did the three hardest things there are to do in the NBA in night one. Can they keep that up? And ask LOJ. We've got some good ones that have come in. It's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Hope you are having a great one. Trying to give you a better background today on the show for those of you watching on YouTube. Always nice to be in these little hotel rooms. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for jumping aboard. We are free and available on all podcasting apps as well as on YouTube. Please give us a five-star review. Please subscribe. Hit the bell notification on YouTube particularly. Then you know when Postcast goes live after games. And you can grab Ron and I right after uh, each and every game. Ron and I will try to be with you for a Twitter spaces today, though I have some meetings today, so that might be a little more difficult than usual. And then um, uh, we will be with you for on the floor before the game at Instagram at DLock09. And then we will be with you for the tip off and the postcast. So we're looking for it. Jazz versus Rudy Gobert. How weird is it going to be to watch? Uh, Rudy was in our hotel last night seeing people. Um, so if you're wondering, uh, he and his agent. Uh, We're both here. Uh, I'm assuming his French agent probably has the number one client that there is in all of basketball right now, Victor Wemenyama. I don't know if that's true, but I kind of just assume it to be true uh, because Buna has uh, done a really nice job with all the French clients. All right. uh, It was interesting as I was prepping for Rudy. I mean, he's great. And it was really interesting to watch Rudy play for Minnesota. Uh, One, it was like I was joking with Thurl on the plane last night that, like, I just saw Rudy. Like, he's awesome. Like I said to him, I said, um, he's like, what did you see? I said, well, I, I saw this really, really big guy who, like, altered, like, 25 shots, who uh, dunked the ball a bunch, who fell over on a post move, who dropped a ball in traffic on a rebound, and who tried two post moves that went badly awry. Like, it was kind of Rudy. Like, he was awesome. Uh, he won the game for him, which was actually a problem if you're Minnesota. Minnesota did not look very good against Oklahoma City. Uh, Oklahoma City, they went up and then uh, Oklahoma City closed it down and actually took the lead. And then Minnesota really had a hard time kind of breaking away um, in that game. Uh, The initial takeaway for Minnesota for this game is that Carl Anthony Towns is actually the one passing to Rudy Gobert. Uh, Rudy had more shots uh, the other night and more uh, field goals and had a big scoring night than he had most nights in Utah, but he only had four assisted field goals. Like for the ongoing conversation of like, um, you know, pass Rudy the ball, and we'll touch on this in a minute because I found some interesting things. He only had four assisted field goals, so he had ten field goals. Six of them, the other six all came on offensive rebounds or something where he created himself. The four assisted field goals, of those assisted field goals. Three of them came from Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, the other one, by the way, is, I mean, we probably should get into this right away. My tongue is firmly implanted in my cheek right now. Is that Anthony Edwards only threw two passes to Rudy Gobert the entire game. I, 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 I'm telling you, we, we, we've got to look into this right away. Anthony Edwards, and none of the field goals were assisted. Uh, Yes. My tongue is permanently implanted in my cheek because of the fact that we dealt with that all of last year, which was one of the least valid um, discussions that we had the whole time. 
by the way. If you're wondering if I'm changing my tune on no, that that was truly maybe one of the stupidest conversations um, that we had in all, in, in all the time. Um, la- the thing that's interesting, though, is is, is the Carl Anthony Towns thing. So um, Anthony Edwards did only th- throw two passes to Rudy Gobert, and only – and none of them led to shots. Um, D'Angelo Russell threw nine passes to Gobert. Three of them led to shots. But Carl Anthony Towns threw ten passes to Rudy Gobert, and five of them led to shots. So that's actually what they're they're running some interesting stuff where they'll run a pick and roll with Rudy on one side of the floor, Rudy rolls, and then they swing to the second side, and the drive comes from that side, and then the lob's there for Rudy. Pretty interesting stuff. Chris Finch did a nice job with some sets. And then... Towns can penetrate and get in the lane because he's just that big, and then he's lobbing it up to Rudy. Uh, interestingly, Rudy did touch the ball dramatically more in Minnesota than he did last year for the Jazz. So I went and looked at it, and uh, the last night, the other night in Minnesota, Rudy Gobert touched the ball uh, and had front court touches and back court touches at a much higher rate. So last uh, night, he had 54 touches in the game. In his last season with Jazz, he had 33. Um, I found it because I was actually looking at passes. In all truthfulness, Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert did not look very uh, in sync at all on the floor. Uh, Edwards was going too fast off the pick and rolls, and then he does just drive in the lane with his head down, and his pass is a pass out. It's not a pass. He doesn't pass in. He he goes in, he passes out, so he'll have to change that. Um, but touches, Rudy had 54 touches uh, fifty-four touches the other night. He was averaging 33 touches with the Jazz, 35 the year before, which then made me like, wow, that seems really low. So I looked back, and the last year with Rubio, Rudy got 60 touches a game, 33 of them in the front court. In 1920, Rudy got 61 touches a game and 33 in the front court. Excuse me, 69 a game. The next year, it drops off coming out of the pandemic when the Jazz try to play a little faster, get those threes up more. He drops to 35 touches a game. And then last year, he only had 33. Now, last year's offense was the number one offense in all of the NBA. So, you know... By the way, the, the, there was a conscious change here in how often Rudy touched the ball. It doesn't have to be negative. Like I, I, I posted this, and everyone immediately went like, oh. I mean, honestly, the offense was the number one offense in the NBA, and the other year they had the number one record in the NBA. So I, I'm not sure those are negatives. I just think they're really, really interesting. Like, Rudy was throwing 46 passes a game in the 1920 season. So we're clearly running the offense through him. We're, giving Rudy touches, keeping him engaged, making him run the floor. There was definitely a feeling from Quinn that if Rudy touches, he'll stay engaged. But in 2021, he suddenly went through 23 passes. In 2022, 21-22, he only threw 21 passes. Last night, or two nights ago in Minnesota now, he threw 34. So they're definitely using him much more actively. Now, interestingly, we only have one night sample size, but I did look it up. Like, how did this impact? Anthony Edwards, D'Angelo Russell, and Carl Anthony Towns, and, and thus far, it really didn't. Russell had four less front court touches out of 37. Anthony Edwards is the one who's impacted. He, had, he went from 38 front court touches to 31. Oh, no, other way around. He actually had more. And Cat had about the same. So, however Chris Finch is doing it right now, he's doing it in a manner that is not seemingly affecting him. Now, what will be interesting is what that does to their pace of play. Because last year, Minnesota ran the second-fewest half-court sets of any team in the NBA. They got out and ran. If you get out and run that much, Rudy's not touching. We tried to accelerate the pace. That's part of the reason why Rudy stopped touching. So this will be really interesting to watch. Um, he, Rudy was great. Minnesota did not look very good. Uh, they did not seem to be, like, collectively kind of have figured this thing out yet. Um, the way they play it, by the way, is that Rudy and... Carl Anthony Towns play the first three minutes of the game together. Maybe first five. Then Rudy subs out early. So they're going with the three stints that Rudy likes to play, the same thing that Quinn did when he changed things up. The other thing, by the way, the other change right there of those touches is that Rudy started playing every minute with Mike Conley. 
maybe that reduced the touches because then Mike's controlling the game at all times because Rudy's playing. Remember, that's the big joke on the whole stupid Donovan Mitchell doesn't pass to Rudy Gobert thing was that Donovan and Rudy actually didn't play that many minutes together. Um, so there really just was not a lot of validity to that argument. But anyway, they play Rudy and Towns together for the first five. Then Towns finishes the first quarter. And then Rudy comes back without Towns. And then they play again together for the final. Only like three or four minutes. So they really are only playing about 14 minutes together. Um, And, you know, we'll see. Obviously, I can give you the one-day sample size. um, But that's really silly. Um, though they did look, honestly, Towns played a funky game. He always does. I find him, I honestly find him one of the m- single most difficult players um, in the NBA to watch play, um, if we're just being completely honest about it. Um, he's just flailing and makes silly plays and wastes possessions. And he, for a player that incredibly talented, um, I, I find I'm, tr- I'm often kind of stunned. Um, so they played better, at least I thought, with, um, Gobert on the floor than with Towns. Uh, they actually ended up playing a total of 22 minutes together, so it must be about seven and four per half. Um, and the offense just didn't work. They shot 39% from the floor, uh, and 18% from three in the minutes in which the two of them were on the floor in game one. I think that's there's it's chances of them going three of seventeen from three, um, with just with the two of them on the floor. Again, I think is pretty unlikely, um, and they were a plus two in that stretch, so they weren't great. And I think they were um, they were better in the period I, way I saw it. And I haven't actually looked at the plus. I should just look at the plus minus in that game. Um, the way I saw it, I thought they were just much better when Rudy was on the floor. But I could be you know completely biased because he's Rudy. So anyway, uh, it'll be fun to watch uh, and how we deal with them. We'll have to, we're going to spread the floor. Um, that's what we do anyway. We play five out. We're going to try to create those driving lanes, make Towns play in space, make Gobert play in space. I haven't been a shoot around, but this is just this is intuitive. Um, is the way I will I would look at this one. All right, I'm going to give you that plus minus number for you. Um, Rudy Gobert was plus thirteen, and Carl Anthony Towns was minus four. And when the two of them were on the floor together, they were plus two. So when Gobert was by himself, they were plus 11. When Towns was by himself, they were minus six, and they won by seven. That all lines up to exactly what the eyeball saw. The Jazz did the three hardest things there are to do in basketball on night one. And we'll touch on impressively what those three were uh, as we continue. Today's show is brought to you by Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. Uh, The Murdochs are amazing. Blake's is such a good dude. Uh, They've been in Utah for over 80 years, and it's just really, really important to them to represent Utah and to um, have the relationship that they do uh, with the people of Utah at all times. And you can see it in the way that they treat their customers. That's the most important thing. Whenever something's gone, you know, slightly misunderstood or awry or something, and I reach out to Blake, I mean, they're right on it. It's just impressive. Uh, the Hyundai lineup of cars is just terrific as well. Uh, we have the Ionic now, which is the electric car, plus we have two of the Santa Fe's. Why? So when I did the research, the amount of car we got and the bells and whistles and the safety features we got, at unprecedented for the price. So if you're going to head out and do the same, Check out any of the SUV lineup, which kicks off with the big Palisade that's just gorgeous with a little zippy coda. Or you're looking at the Ionic or the North American Car of the Year, the Elantra. Feel free to email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com. That's dlock09 at gmail.com. And uh, we'll set you up with a VIP meeting for uh, at Murdoch Hyundai. And we'll set you up with Cam and and Murray or, or Jake over in Linden. And make sure that you get that perfect meeting. It is Murdoch Hyundai, located 4646 South State Street, also in Logan and in Linden. Today's show is also brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline, giving you all the scores, insight, news, betting 
information that you could possibly get, go to betonline.net. Uh, Detroit Lions are a seven-point dog against the Cowboys. If you're looking for your survivor pool, that is not the pick, though. Tampa Bay is a 13-point favorite against Carolina, who just traded the roster, but also got all of San Francisco's draft stash. Wow. NBA tonight. Full dock of the game should be a fun one. Jazz and the Wolves. The Wolves are an eight and a half point favorite over Utah. Houston is a six and a half point dog against Memphis. Uh, and the Warriors are a five and a half point favorite over Denver, who just did not look great against us. Be interesting to see how long it takes them to get going. Our next opponent is the Pelicans. They're a seven point favorite in Charlotte. You can get it all at betonline.net, where the game starts the three hardest things to do in the NBA and the Jazz did them all by the way thank you very much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day for your second listen make sure you listen to Locked on Sports today thanks by the way I got some great feedback on game to game it's your NBA recap show Uh, I appreciate it I love the feedback give me the same on Locked on Sports today Lockdown Sports Today is what I would call, it's the old sports page. It's ESPN.com front page. It's um, basically everything you need to know about what's going on in the sports world. The three biggest stories plus a bunch of other information that you need to know for the day to go to the water cooler at the office because you have a life, wife, kids, things that mean that you cannot update girlfriend, parties, whatever, that mean that you cannot update yourself on what's going on in the sports world perfectly. So, therefore, we do it for you. That's the concept. Uh, so, check it out. Locked on Sports today. It's a YouTube program as really well done, uh, as well as a uh, podcast. It's also on all your streaming apps um, at Locked on Sports Atlanta or Locked on Sports Minnesota. You can get those uh, on any of your Roku or Amazon Fires. The three hardest things to do in the NBA, I know this sounds crazy, are to play hard, to share, and to make shots. The last one, somewhat uncontrollable, frankly. The first two are the hardest things to do in the NBA. Guard LeBron, guard Giannis, sure. But the schedule is such that playing hard every night is really, really hard to do. And will be interesting from a jazz standpoint to see whether the the depth of talent allows us to do it every night. Can Will Hardy find the guys each night that have the juice uh, and have the energy uh, to be able to play hard and keep that level? I walked to the airplane with Will yesterday. Like, you know, if they play that hard every night, yeah, like that's it. Uh, we have NBA players. We're, we're, we're not at a dramatic talent deficiency. Now, we are in a sense that, like, the three best players in tonight's game probably play for Minnesota, right? Anthony Edwards, Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns. So the three best, not in that order. Um, you all know my order. Uh, the three best players play for Minnesota, okay? And then if you, like, draft the next set of players, like, probably get into Lowry Market and D'Angelo Russell gets picked pretty soon. And then just, and Jade McDaniels looks incredible. Incredible. That was my biggest takeaway of Minnesota's game. He looked great. Um, and then you get Jordan Clarkson and Mike Conley and, and Larry Markin and, and and then you get into a bunch of jazz players. Like these guys are bona fide, legitimate NBA caliber players. And they're playing for something. And the schedule, like we're playing three games in four nights right now. Like the schedule makes it super hard to play that hard every single night. But that's going to be the... F- The second thing is the NBA world makes it hard to share. Um, The accolades you get are based on what your box score looks like. You know, someone was talking to me about Ennis Cantor once, and they said the biggest problem we have with Ennis Cantor is that all of his friends in Europe wake up and they look at the box score and they look at whatever the box score in Europe is or probably online, so it's points and rebounds. And then they text him about it. So if he played five minutes and he didn't get eight points and rebounds, then they're texting Ennis Kanter. All of his friends are in Europe saying, hey, what's up? And then if he has a big night, they're all saying, congratulations. 
But the box score doesn't say, like, well, Ennis Kanter had 16 points, 12 rebounds, and allowed 32, which is, seems high. But, right, there's no – they're not texting Ennis Kanter and saying, wow, that's an awesome plus-minus you had tonight, Ennis. Like, hey, way to go, 16 and 12, right? Like, that's the feedback that you're getting all the time. That's symbolic of what every one of our players deals with all the time. You know, hey, a great win last night was what was said. Like, and whenever, that was so fun. Great win, great win, great win. And maybe that can last. Like, that would be awesome. But there's also a point in the process where great win and, hey, you know, you're averaging 13, you used to average 17. Hey, last time you averaged with Colin Sexton. Like, last time you averaged 24, you're, you're averaging 17. Everything all right? Like, it starts to, it starts to build. So it, it might seem like, you know, everything we learned in, everything we need to know in life we learned in kindergarten is actually probably true in this case, but it is true that the, th- the three hardest things to do in the NBA are to play hard every night. Schedule, opponents are there to make it so you don't. Frankly, I think if most people are honest, playing hard every day of life is not that easy. Like, whatever your life is, playing hard is... Like, it's not that easy. Um, Executing all of what you want to get done every day is, I I fail all the time, and I don't have someone trying to dunk on me. Um, You know, I mean, right? Like, I had had a check mark of things that needed to get done yesterday before I got to bed. Well, guess what? Like, at midnight, I crashed. I didn't get them done. You know, I'm trying to sleep this year. Um, I mean, relatively to some level. Okay, a little, I mean, a time. Okay, that's a problem I have that has nothing to do with you. I'll keep it to myself. Okay, I hope you're laughing. What did I get last night? Should we keep a daily tab on coming off three hours and 41 minutes? I got six hours and 46 minutes today. Woohoo! Just about doubled it. I'm going big tomorrow. I'm going to see if I can cross over eight. Not a chance in hell. Um, all right, anyway. Um, personal issues leaking into the show. But, I mean, I think that's really true. And then sharing is hard, too, right? Um we, we did a nice job at dinner as a broadcast crew. We all shared an unbelievable meal here in Minnesota. Petit Leon, just incredible. I'm all over the place right now. All right, save me. Let's go to Ask LOJ. Get me out of my own problems and in my own head. And um, I, if someone has, like, a Ph.D. in psychology and listens to this show, it must be a flipping field day. Thank you very much for making Locked on Jazz the first listen of the day. Locked on sports today. Please check it out. Please send feedback. You guys built the network uh, with your feedback. So uh, would very much be interested in hearing what you have to say um, on Locked on sports today uh, and whether you like it nearly as much as I do. All right. Let's get to our Ask LOJ questions of the day. Our first one comes in and says, whoa, I turned it off and turned it on. It says, who do you think stands out this foster? But I think that's just an autocorrect, and I have no problem with typos. As one of the most interesting, most likely to make an impact for our team down the road, not offensive creativ- creativity or puts the uh, most numbers up, but who will be a pivotal piece on this roster? Um, so most interesting to me so far is unquestionably Walker Kessler. Uh Because I think you're dealing with, like, every stereotype imaginable. I think you're dealing with um, the fact that the league is, everyone wants to believe that the league is going small when it's actually not going small. Um, It's actually going big. It's just going versatile. And so when Walker Kessler got kind of labeled as a immobile stiff um, in the draft process and dropped to 23 despite setting the NCAA record for blocks, you know, and we're going to see what happens to him in space. I think it was against Miami, Florida in the NCAA tournament. He didn't look great in space. Like, that's still, like, that's the number one thing we got to watch is how does he do in space? And how does he do with foul trouble and all sorts of things? And they protected him. Will Hardy protected him beautifully the other night against Jokic. But I think, I, I do think that he's a really interesting player. Um, he runs the four beautifully. His second jump is something I never anticipated out of him. His ability to catch and jump without coiling is terrific. Um, His exuberance is lovely. And so he's the most interesting player to me. Um, And probably high on the list of, like, players most likely to contribute for the Jazz in the next five years. Like, he's really – 
excuse me, uh, he really has done impressive things in that regard. So great question. Thank you very much. All right, let's go to our next one. Last episode didn't really touch on how fun Lowry marketing was. Thoughts on him? I thought he showed a lot of progress from previous seasons, and I hope he's a core member of this team moving forward. I did. I failed you there. Um, I think Lowry marketing is fabulous, um, and I think it's going to be one of the most interesting uh, developments of the season. And he would be the player, you know, as we quest for, like, whose jersey am I buying? What's my core? What's the core of the future? Like, I think Lowry Markkinen would be on the back of the high school yearbook, like, most likely to be core player in five years. Um, his body is incredible, 7 feet, 240 pounds. His mobility with that body is incredible. And he has a incredibly wide array skill set. And now the question is, how does he continue to develop that and get better and better at those things? So, yes, um, Lowry Markkinen is a great joy. He battles defensively. He he had a rebound the other night uh, in traffic high above all others that, like, just a lot of guys can't do. Like, he's doing two or three things a night that most players can't do. So, yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I think Lowry Markkinen is um, a super special talent and a majorly important piece to the future of the Utah Jazz. Oh, well, what is most exciting to you about Walker Kessler has shown so far, and how does he uh, drop big, survive in the league going forward? So I kept this question in because even though I'd answered the first half of it, I thought the second part was important, particularly because we're playing Rudy. So I don't think drop big is going away. So drop big is... If, if for those who are new to the show and um, maybe learning the NBA as the season goes on, drop big is in a pick and roll, uh, in a pick and roll, the ball, the ball, hit, the pick gets set on the ball handler's man. And now the big guy whose guy just set the pick, right? So um, tonight you'll see D'Angelo Russell will have the ball for the Minnesota. Rudy Gobert will set the pick. Russell comes off the pick. Rudy's man, or D'Angelo Russell's man, the guy who's guarding the ball handler, now has to get over the pick and trail and try to catch up. The big man drops, protects the rim, and stays below Rudy Gobert rolling and impedes the progress of the ball handler at the same time. It's very difficult to do. Nobody does it better in the history of the game than Rudy Gobert. Uh, Walker Kessler is a drop big. The problem with drop bigs is that Draymond Green stands over the basketball and you're guarding Draymond and Clay Thompson comes around the curl and they hand off to Clay Thompson and Draymond picks the guy and your big is back and Clay Thompson's wide open for a three. The problem with the drop big is that Donovan Mitchell comes off that pick the drip, and it's a wide open three off the bounce. The other problem is that as the best players in the world can hit mid-range shots, as you're driving the lane and the big's dropping, the great thing about the drop big is it protects the rim, which is still the number one goal of all defenses. And the off-the-bounce three is a much more difficult shot uh, than a catch-and-shoot three. So the drop big is going to stay in the league. It's, I think it's still got 24 viable minutes, maybe 30 viable minutes a night in the NBA. It's still just it's mathematically night in and night out the right play. In the playoffs, the drop big is going to struggle because the versatility of defense of switching is going on. Part of the reason on the Rudy touches, I didn't really get into it that deeply. I'm giving you the best part of the show right now. It's good. It's really, really well done, David. 29 minutes into the show to give you the two best pieces of the whole show from a basketball X's and O standpoint. So part of the thing with the, with those passes and touches for Rudy, the re, I, I didn't want to, like, bury the whole show in it. The, Rudy gets all the dunks that year. The league changes the way they defend us. They start switching everything. And then Rudy doesn't get the touches because that's actually kind of the way the league works. It's like once you start switching and defense, and the way the league works is the defenses actually dictate the offenses, Right. Kevin Pelton's always said, it, said like, the defense can d dictates the rim, the offense dictates the threes. That's really true. The, the defense dictates the game. 
So if you're switching, it eliminates ball movement. It eliminates some of the things you're doing. You have to play it differently, penetrate. If you're playing drop big, then that opens up other things. So the defense dictates. The, the touches on Rudy thing we talked about earlier is I think is everyone started switching us and then Rudy couldn't get the ball as much. And Rudy isn't someone you can just throw the ball in the post to and get the ball. That, Like I saw somebody say, uh, oh, the, the Minnesota's using in the way France did. Eh, no, not accurate. And frankly, Rudy's post-ups the other night were bad. Um, the part two of that is super interesting on this is that Minnesota, who last year you came off a pick and they trapped you with two guys, blitzed it, and it kind of worked usually for a quarter and as nights went on, everyone adjusted and, and they got worse and worse defensively. Minnesota was like the fourth best team in first quarters. They were like, I think they were the 16th best team in second quarters and then by the fourth quarter, they were 25th best team in the league. Teams figured it out. You can't play that way. It just doesn't work for a long, long term. You're, they also allowed a pretty high level of threes last year. They were 24th in the league in denying threes. This year, they won't play that way. They'll just drop Rudy and they'll hug to the corners. Same way we used to play. So you'll see Minnesota will allow far less threes and all those kind of things. So the drop big still has a role in the league. You just have to have a good drop big to do it. I think that's where we got to. Uh, one last question coming in. Oop, that's, and this is actually left over, but I know it's what a lot of people want to know. Um, why do you think Abaji isn't getting minutes? So, really, Abaji is a two. And we do have a, a, a glut of twos right now, or of guards, with Sexton, Conley, Beasley, and Clarkson. So, those minutes are hard to come by. Horton Tucker's kind of taking that three spot. Well, over Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Alexander-Walker, I think, played better than Abaji. I don't know if Abaji would slide to the three. Um, and I think that the reality is that, like, we have guys in front of them that are playing better. And over time, like, I wouldn't worry. If somebody you want getting minutes, like, let time pass over 82 games and everyone will get their minutes. Like, I want to see Fonchecchio. So does the so does the team. Um, I think Balmaro has a chance. So does the team. You know, uh, I would suspect Mike Conley does not play in Houston on the back-to-back, and then that's an opportunity for another guy to play. Time. Everyone right now is getting their first chance at it. If everyone plays like they did the other night, then frankly, we're not going to see Fonchecchio and Abaji for much of the season. But that's not how it works because actually the hardest thing to do is play hard. The second hardest thing to do is to share and probably the third hardest thing to do is stay healthy. And so we'll see this evolve as the year goes on and these guys will will get some time and get some opportunities. Um, Abaji, it's worth noting, was a slow starter in college and a slow starter in high school. So let's give him some space and let him adapt to the league. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. Hopefully, very interesting. If the audio is good today, we just learned an awful lot. Um, so hopefully it was. Talk to you guys soon.